congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this Sunday, we look at the priestly office of Christ. We've looked at his office of prophet. We've, we've looked at his office of king. We look at his priestly office this morning. And in this Old Testament foreshadow, we get yet another hint or glimpse of the superiority of Christ. Specifically this morning, the superior, superiority of his priesthood to all the priests that came before him. And on a topic like this, a subject like this of, of the priests or priesthood, there are many passages we could turn to in the Old Testament, but we want to look at what I think is the most important one this morning, and one which, of course, is explicitly mentioned in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Jesus is spoken in the book of Hebrews as the forerunner who has entered the presence behind the veil, the one who has gone before us into the most holy place where no one but the high priest was permitted to go, and that only once a year. And Jesus, in contrast to all the priests and high priests of the Old Testament, has a continuous priesthood, which sets him apart and raises him above all priests that came before him. And this was foreshadowed by an Old Testament priest called Melchizedek. And so we're looking this morning at the inspired record of the meeting of Abraham with Melchizedek and its implications for our salvation. And Melchizedek is called in verse 18 of our passage, the king of Salem and the priest of the God Most High. And one of the benefits of this passage is that we see a time together of the offices of priest and king. And so already this is a pointer to Christ holding all the offices of prophet, priest, and king in one person. But we're not going to focus on that this morning. We'll be mostly focusing on the priesthood of Melchizedek and how Christ, Jesus, was the great priest to come. Our theme this morning is simply this. The Lord pictures the superior priesthood of Christ in Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek. We'll see in the first place his superior qualification. In the second place, his superior right of acquisition. But as the Lord our God pictures the superior priesthood of Christ Jesus in Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek, we see in the first place the superior qualification of Christ pictured here. In other words, we learn from the biblical record of Melchizedek that Jesus was a greater, more qualified priest than the Old Testament priests who were descended from the tribe of Levi. And one of the questions that we have to wrestle with is, why was there even a need for a priesthood that was superior to the Levitical priesthood? Was the Levitical priesthood not good enough? And the New Testament answers with a resounding, no, it was not good enough. Well, first of all, let's talk about the Old Testament priesthood. Israel, of course, boys and girls, we know, were served by priests who were, according to God's express command, from the tribe of Levi. They had to be born of Levite lineage. Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, was also from the tribe of Levi, and he was the first high priest given to Israel. And every high priest after him was to be a direct descendant of Aaron. And every priest had to be a Levite from the tribe of Levi. And through the Levitical priesthood, sacrifices were offered. An atonement was made for Israel's sins. Or to put it more plainly, Israel, the Israelites would sin. And the command given to them was that they were to bring an animal sacrifice to be given to the priest to make atonement for their sins, to quiet the wrath of God against them for their sins. The priests would have the job of slaughtering these animals brought by the Israelites to the tabernacle and later on in the temple. And they would then pour out the blood of these animals on the altar or they would burn the carcasses or parts of them. Or sometimes it was grain or oil that was brought as an offering. This was the system that God had put in place through Moses to make atonement for Israel's sins. The function of the priests and the high priests was to maintain the holiness 
of Israel before God. They were mediators standing between God and his people. They were, we might say it this way, they were representatives of Israel to God, and they were representatives of God to Israel in their sanctified position of holiness. But what we're seeing here is that there was a need for a priesthood that was even more superior to the Levitical priesthood. And we're saying that Christ, and this is clearly seen in the New Testament, Christ has satisfied that need. And his work was foreshadowed by the ancient king priest Melchizedek. And you see the problem with these Levitical priests, and we heard that in, in uh, Hebrews 7 verse 23, the problem with them is that they could not provide a continuous, ongoing atonement for sin. They could not erase guilt permanently. And the simple reason for that is because, as the author of Hebrews points out, they could not continue in their office because, well, the fact is, they were flesh and blood human beings and they would die. And so uh, a superior priesthood was necessary because it, the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. What was needed was one who could continue his work forever, whose sacrifice was continually offered. A different class or order of priests was needed, one according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, we have to ask now, well, who was this Melchizedek? Well, we first hear of him in uh, Genesis 14. And there's not a lot of explanation given as to who he is or what significance he will play in our salvation in the context of the whole Bible. He's simply introduced into the story as the king of Salem, which, by the way, is an older name for Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 76, verse 2, we hear Salem being called the place of the Lord's tabernacle. And at the time of the writing of this psalm, the Lord's tabernacle was located in Jerusalem. And so Salem, Jerusalem, same city, same place. What Jerusalem's relationship to the other cities mentioned in Genesis 14 uh, is it's not mentioned to us. We're just told that Melchizedek comes out to greet Abraham with bread and wine after his victory. And his sudden and mysterious appearance gives him a quality of timelessness like a symbol of eternity. But, of course, we don't catch that from Genesis 14. As a matter of fact, we don't catch it until much later in the Bible. Melchizedek is, for sure, an awe-inspiring figure, but if we did not have passages like Psalm 110 or Hebrews 7, we would be left with more questions and answers concerning him. And so, for instance, and that's why we sang from Psalm 110... But we hear in Psalm 110, verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. You, and this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this psalm is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the power, of the authority to be bestowed upon Him by God the Father. And it speaks of an oath taken by the Lord that He would not go back on that Christ would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And the interesting thing is that David, who is the author of, this, of Psalm 110, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, mentions here another priestly order, not according to the order of Levi, but the order of Melchizedek. And the main difference is given in the word forever. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We're given a clue here already that the priesthood of Christ would be everlasting, never-ending, ongoing. But you know, even this does not fill out everything for us, does it? If all we had was Genesis 14 and Psalm 110, we'd still be scratching our heads trying to figure this out. Praise the Lord, He has given us the New Testament which sheds light on the old, and he's given us the book of Hebrews. Listen, in fact, we didn't read this in the interest of time, but uh, listen to the first three verses of Hebrews 7. 
For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned the tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, from the Hebrew word shalom, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. And we want, what we want to catch here especially is this business of Melchizedek being without father or mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, there's a lot, and we have to be honest, there's a lot we don't understand about this. And Melchizedek, maybe until heaven, will continue to remain something of a mystery to the church. And we're not to delve into mysteries that are not explained to us by God. God has given us all we need to know in this life. But what we want to see is that Jesus' priesthood is like that of Melchizedek's. He remains a priest continually. His ministry is ongoing. You say, well, what's the advantage of that? Well, Hebrews 7 verse 22 tells us, because Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he has become, says the inspired author of Hebrews, a guarantor, a surety of a better covenant. Now, boys and girls, let's just pause for a second. Make sure you're with us. When we talk about the word covenant, what do we mean? When we talk about the word covenant in the biblical context, we're talking about this agreement that God our Father has made with us. You can use the word deal, um, contract, different things. It, it talks about what God does with us. In the covenant that God makes with us, He comes to us and He makes a declaration. He says something to us. He says, I am going to be your God and you are going to be my people. I am taking you to be my own, and I'm going to be a God to you. That's the covenant that God makes with us. And as with all agreements, covenants, contracts, there are conditions to be met by both parties. But what are the conditions of our agreement with God? Well, first of all, God agrees to be our protector, our provider, our shield, our defender, our savior. He says, I'm going to be all these things to you. I'm going to be a father to you. What's our end of the deal? We must walk, and listen to this, we must walk in perfect obedience and thankfulness before God every day of our lives. And as soon as we say that, we say, here's the problem. That's a big, big problem because we can't hold up our end of the contract. Now, the Old Testament Levitical priesthood provided a means, because the Israelites were in the same situation that we are in, the Old Testament Levitical priesthood provided a means whereby sins could be covered for a time. As we discussed earlier, the bringing of animals to the tabernacle or the temple. But what we're seeing in the book of Hebrews is that this was by no means a permanent solution. And that's why we needed Jesus whose priesthood was superior to the Old Testament priesthood. How so? Simply this. The Old Testament priests had a shelf life. They had a best before date. That's a nice way of saying their time on earth was limited because they would eventually die. At some point, they would pass from this earth. The priesthood of Christ which is foreshadowed in the priesthood of Melchizedek. And that's how Melchizedek comes into the picture. That priesthood of Christ is permanent because Christ is eternal. Unlike the Old Testament priests whose work was cut short by their deaths, Christ lives forever. The inspired author of Hebrews in chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore he is able, listen to this, he is able to save to the uttermost, to the uttermost, to the nth degree. His salvation is limitless. 
He leaves nothing uncovered. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Since he lives to make intercession for them. Beloved, we have a high priest who saves us completely. Leaving no sin uncovered. No sin, no guilt unforgiven. And he does this once and for all. And the good news that we celebrate is that Jesus Christ has come and he has completed the work for which he was sent. And in him, not only are our sins atoned for, but they always will be. And that's wonderful news because if we still lived, picture it, if we still lived under the Old Testament system, well, you answer this question. How often would we be going up to the tabernacle with our animals? Daily, probably. Several times a day, perhaps. But Christ has eliminated that need. Because he's a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Of a higher order because he always lives to ensure our forgiveness. But as the Lord our God pictures the superior priesthood of Christ in Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek, we see in the second place his superior right of acquisition. In other words, Melchizedek acquired or received an offering that if he had just been an ordinary person, he would have had no right to receive it. In verse 20 of our passage, we read that Abraham gave him a tithe or a tenth of all. And why? Because Melchizedek had come out to him with bread and wine and then blessed him. And in return, Abraham gave him a tenth of all the spoils, all the plunder taken from the enemy. And as we said, there's a lot of mystery about Melchizedek. But here in uh, Genesis 14, we learn a couple of things. We learn that he was a priest of the God of Abraham, the Most High God, a name, by the way, that is found in Psalm 78, verse 35. And so it would seem that although paganism was flourishing on the earth at this time, because you know the events leading up to this, right? Eventually Sodom and Gomorrah would be destroyed by God, and we know that the wickedness reigned on the earth at that time. There was mass perversion, all kinds of evil going on. But at least this passage tells us that there were those who still knew and worshipped the true and living God, the Most High God. And when Abraham meets him, he recognizes a brother in the faith and a father in the faith. And he would have uttered his amen to the blessing of Melchizedek, that it was the Most High God and no other who had delivered his enemies into his hand. And Indeed, it had been an astounding victory for Abraham with an army that was just a mite bigger than the army of Gideon. Boys and girls, you remember how big the army of Gideon was when they went against the Midianites? I won't tell you. Something good to scratch your head about. Go home and look it up a little bit in your Bible. But Abraham's army was just a mite bigger than Gideon's army. And with that little army, He had attacked and defeated the combined army of three pagan kings. And he had rescued his nephew Lot from their hands. And it really was an impossible feat by human calculations. But it doesn't surprise us too much, does it? Because the God we worship, the God of the Bible, is the God of the impossible. If he is for us, who can stand against us? And so Abram was enabled to administer a crushing defeat upon his enemies. And then Melchizedek comes out to meet him and he blesses him. And the God who had given him such a victory, and then we read that Abram gave him a tithe of all. Now again, if this is all we had, if all we had was Genesis 14, we'd be left with this. Well, that's nice. But that was a pretty good thing for Abram to do, you know, he Man blesses him, he gives him a tenth of the plunder. That was pretty nice of him. If that's all we had, that's where we would stay. But the Lord has not just given, that, given us that. He, he gives us Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews 7, 
He expands on this to show that there was a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Hebrews 7 teaches us that according to the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Levites were the ones who were to receive tithes, the gifts, the gifts and offerings of God's people. Only Levites had this right. But in Genesis 14, we read of Melchizedek receiving tithes from Abram. And the inspired author of Hebrews tells us that in effect, Levi, who was the forefather of the Levites, in effect, he paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was still in the loins of his father, well, his great-grandfather to be exact. Now, Le Levi, of course, did not do this literally. He had not even been born yet. But in the fact that Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek, it was as if Levi had done it as well. And so Melchizedek, we see here, had a superior right of acquisition. He was not a Levite, and yet he received tithes. And he received it even from Levi himself, in a sense. Well, okay, that's all good, but why is this important? Because it proves that the priesthood of Christ is superior to the Old Testament Levitical priesthood. Since Christ is priest, as God promised in Psalm 110, and this is repeated in Hebrews 7, Christ is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Christ, in other words, is in the same higher category or order of priest as Melchizedek, not of the tribe of Levi, yet having the right to acquire tithes. Jesus, of course, was from the tribe of Judah, a non-priestly tribe. And yet his tribal lineage does not disqualify Jesus from being priest because he is a priest according to a different order, according to the order of Melchizedek. And beloved of God, this is wonderful news for us because we needed a priest, not in conformity with the Old Testament Levitical system because that would not have done us any permanent good. We needed a priest who was superior to the Old Testament priests, who far exceeded what they could do and accomplish. We needed a priest who could love us and give himself for us to use the words of Ephesians 5 verse 2, who would love us and give himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. In other words, we needed a priest who could not only offer sacrifices for us, but one who could give himself as a ransom for us. We needed a priest who, according to the language of Hebrews 7 verse 25, does not need to offer daily sacrifices as in the Old Testament system, but to offer a once-for-all sacrifice. And the, the effects of which is continual and ongoing. You know why that's such a blessing and such a comfort? Because let's face it, we never stop sinning, do we? We're catechized, we make profession of faith, we grow up in the faith, we go to church all our lives, we're converted, and yet we find ourselves slipping and falling back into sin again and again and again. You know how nice it would be if there was a time limit on our sinning on this earth? What, for instance, how, how, uh, how crazy would it be if we could say, well, our children don't start sinning until they're 15 or 18. And until they're t that time, they're sinless, pure little angels. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But no, they sin all their lives, right? From the womb to the tomb. Wouldn't it be nice that you could talk to somebody who are in their older years, in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and they could say, you know what's nice? Something, young fella, young, youngin, that you could look forward to, is when you hit my age, you no longer sin anymore. Wouldn't that be great? But that's not true, is it? We sin all our lives. We never, all through our lives, we don't take a Sabbath from sinning, do we? 
We don't go through a, a, a period of time where we say, you know, for this season, I'm just not going to sin against God anymore, neither in thought, word, nor deed. I'm going to take a sabbatical from sinning. We don't even take a day off from sinning, even into our old age. And beloved of God, that's why it's such wonderful news that we have a high priest who has offered himself as a sacrifice because his own blood is more precious than all silver and gold and his work is continual and ongoing. No other further sacrifice need to be made. Let us then, as fallen sinners who are inconsistent in our obedience to God, we who are repeat offenders, let us come to Christ in true faith, believing that He is our only, ever-living, self-sacrificing priest whose priesthood is superior to all others. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, I invite you on the basis of God's word this morning to cast all your sins upon Him, to surrender to Him, and believe that He and He alone can give you perfect and continual peace with God. Amen.